Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. That was a fabulous way to open the conference, to remind it, to be reminded of all the opening, all the emerging threats that we face. We are now going to talk about the most important of those emerging threats. So may I ask Emma Belcher, Rose Gottmuller, and Daphna Linzer to come up to the stage, please, if they can get through the crush. <laughs> Thank you so much. And you'll see that this is a slight change in the schedule. Toria Newland from the State Department will still be with us. The poor woman has just had about seven flight changes and is still flying in. So we're really grateful to Rose and Emma and Daphna for switching their session around for us. We are now discussing what is the ever-present existential threat of nuclear warfare. The risk of a nuclear weapon being used today is arguably the highest it's been since the Cuban Missile Crisis due to Putin's dangerous saber-rattling and due to the fact that China is expanding its arsenal at breakneck speed. Simultaneously, Iran and North Korea continue being actors acting badly in the international system and degrading the nuclear non-proliferation regime. We have no one better to discuss these threats than former Deputy Secretary General of NATO, Rose Gottmuller, Emma Belcher, the president of the Plowshares Fund, and Daphna Linzer, who runs Political. Thank you so much, ladies. Take it away. Thank you, Anya. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Daphna Linzer. I'm the executive editor of Politico. Um, we just had a very emotional last end to that, to that panel, and I know Courtney, um, had said she didn't want to leave everyone <laughs> feeling a little helpless. So you can imagine how perfect it is to segue into nuclear weapons. Um, <laughs> especially because it's Friday, we're in this beautiful place, so this has got to be the pro move. Um, but obviously this is serious and it's, it's an inflection point here. And um, you know, the threat of nuclear war kind of made by the Russian president uh, altered, you know, altered the West's position in Ukraine. Uh, yesterday we heard the head of MI6 uh, posit that Iran may not accept uh, another nuclear deal. Uh, so there's, there's much to discuss here in reducing risk. Um, as, as Anya said, Aspen has, has ever brought, uh, brought us uh, two exceptional thinkers, and I'm going to introduce them myself right now. Uh, Rose Godmuller, uh, most recently, as Anya said, served as Deputy Secretary General of NATO until 2019. She previously served as Under Secretary of State for Arms Control and International Security at the U.S. State Department. I first met Rose when I was covering nonproliferation at the Washington Post, and she uh, was working on U.S.-Russia relations then. And nuclear security. Emma Belcher is the new president of Plowshares Fund uh, and has devoted her career to nuclear security, including as an advisor to the government of Australia on national security and international affairs. Um, I'm going to leave some time uh, for questions, but we have a lot on our plate, so, uh, so we're just going to get started. Um, and uh, Rose, I, I began a little bit by talking about an inflection point. Um, can you set the stage for us a little bit here? Because 2022 is very different uh, than it was, let's say, in 2010 when we're talking about nuclear deterrence. Yes, it's very true. And I can see three big things in the area of uh, strategic nuclear weapons. The first thing that's different from 2010 is that the New START Treaty is in force and has been in force for the past 10 years. Now, that has lent us a good deal of predictability during this period of a lot of worry about the nuclear saber rattling coming out of the Kremlin. The Russians are sending us every day notifications about the status of their nuclear forces. These are routine notifications. There is no evidence that they are upping the operational readiness of their nuclear forces. And New START, along with our intelligence sources, helps us to understand that. So that's been an important innovation. The second thing that is different from 
2010 is that the Russians have more or less completed their nuclear modernization now. It was still very much in train in 2010, but we've seen the emergence in recent years of these so-called exotic delivery systems, air-launched ballistic missile, the heavy Sarmat, uh, heavy ICBM, the Sarmat isn't such a uh, an exotic system, but they put in place a number of new systems that are of concern. So we've got to watch that space very, very carefully. The third thing that is different, oh, let me say before I go on to the third thing, is that means we now have to focus on our nuclear modernization and we have to ensure that we carry it forward. I'll talk about that a little bit more later. But the fact that the Russians have completed their modernization more or less, and we are right at the beginning of ours, we have got to keep our eye on that prize. The third point then is China and what has been happening with the Chinese nuclear modernization. We're all concerned about the number of ICBM silos they've been digging in the western and northern deserts of China, and we also see evidence that they're building up their numbers of warheads still far below what the U.S. and Russia have. We each, U.S. and Russia, have over 4,000 warheads, and the Chinese are down around 500 more or less, but here again, we have to keep a sharp eye on what is going on with China, and I will also talk about that some more going forward. But that's the stage on the strategic nuclear front. Yeah, that's so helpful. And even just hearing you talk about sort of the, the intelligence on where Russia is in terms of its nuclear readiness or where we thought it was in, in the weeks and months uh, ahead of the invasion of Ukraine, but Emma, talk a little bit about that because the, the West's entire posture was framed around a, a nuclear threat from Putin. It seemed to work. Yeah, well, when we look at what Putin has done here, how his nuclear weapons have enabled him to invade a sovereign country, which has resulted in war crimes, humanitarian crisis, and really impacted the global economy, and in a sense, he has used his nuclear weapons, even though he hasn't detonated them. He has used them as a tool to support his aggression and limit the response of the US and NATO. This really changes everything. And it's a critical point for us to think about what we need to do next. And we don't want to allow Putin to get away with nuclear blackmail. We don't want to allow him to hold the world hostage, but we're in a dilemma because of the nuclear uh, uh, spectre that remains there, whether the threat of use or actual use constrains our ability to respond for fear of escalation. So we're in a really challenging point, both with respect to what we do now with the current crisis with Ukraine and what we need to be doing in the future. So right now, what I think we need to do with the current crisis is we need to continue supporting Ukraine and make sure that we're not escalating to potential nuclear use. We also really, we need to get to a point where there is a negotiated end to the crisis that is favourable to Ukraine and doesn't send, sorry, doesn't reward Putin for his nuclear blackmail. And then third, we need to disincentivise copycats who might be thinking about using nuclear threats to achieve their aggression, or countries that might seek to try to acquire their own nuclear weapons to guarantee their own security, because more countries with more weapons is just a recipe for disaster. Now, this is gonna be incredibly challenging because of this nuclear spectre that I was talking about that limits our, our options, but it's critical that we focus on this now and that we think about what we need to be doing in the long term to address the concerns that Rose has articulated about Russia's modernization and China's modernization and the ICBM silos that have been discovered recently and uh, evidence or information about um, them increasing their warheads. Just a real quick comment, Emma. I agree with everything you've said, but there is a two-way deterrence street going on here because Putin, despite the threats repeatedly made, by Russian officials about attacks against uh, NATO aid to the Ukrainians, they have not touched NATO territory in any way, shape, or form. So there's a two-way deterrence streak going on here. I just wanted to make that point. I absolutely agree. I'd actually save that talking point for my final question, but I'll address it now <laughs> because absolutely we see nuclear deterrence at work here. It's at play both with respect to the US and NATO 
and with respect to Putin. Uh, he hasn't, as you've said, expanded the war for fear of potential uh, escalation and retaliation. Now, the challenge, though, is that, you know, the nu nuclear deterrence is at play, but it hasn't exactly kept the peace, and that's what's a real challenge here for us to grapple with going forward, because being in this situation and having it come up again and again is really untenable. I've got some thoughts that we might share later on about how we address that, but you're absolutely right to point that out. Well, that sounds very hopeful, but I don't want to minimize uh, the threat that was at play here, because I, I think we all took it very seriously. Uh, the Biden administration sure took it very seriously. And I want to ask you both, uh, can't China just play the same card? Can Iran? Well, ab absolutely, in the case of China, all they, though they have been very circumspect historically about articulating nuclear threats, and I still see that on the second track, but one wonders now that they are beginning to build up their forces if they won't take a more muscular attitude toward, uh, toward articulating nuclear threats and putting that out there. But to your other point, Daphna, I would just like to say that um, I was talking about the strategic nuclear forces and the fact that they have not been raised in their, their uh, operational readiness on the Russian side. But I think what we're all worried about is the, the lesser dreadful case of a single demonstration strike, perhaps over the Black Sea, or the use of a nuclear weapon, a single nuclear weapon against a Ukrainian ground target. So I was much taken by uh, Stanovaya's article this week where she said Putin's in a kind of steady state at this moment. He feels like he's getting ahead. But the moment that he feels like he's stumbling and no longer getting ahead, that is the moment of danger. And I still worry about that. I am not worried about a strategic nuclear exchange between the United States and the Russian Federation. I am concerned about that dreadful but smaller case. Yeah, Rose, I absolutely agree. And I'd say I think there's reason to think he might skip some kind of demonstration um, over the sea and go straight to nuclear use in Ukraine as a real demonstration resolve potentially seeing that some, a strike that doesn't cause that kind of damage might not be strong enough to signal his intent. Uh, we, we just don't know, but it's a very worrying concern. Yeah, we're in a, we're in a tricky, tricky moment. I mean, talk a little bit about what you think can be done for nuclear arms control with, with Russia and China right now. Rose, why don't you start? Yes, well, it's obviously not the moment to go back to the negotiating table with the Russians right now, and uh, no one questions that at all. I referred a, a moment ago, though, to the fact that the Russians have been keeping up the pace with regard to uh, this notifications regime under the New START Treaty that's giving us a lot of predictability about 24-7 what's going on in their nuclear force structure. The first thing I think we need to do is get back to on-site inspections under New START. They were suspended because of the COVID-19 pandemic. We haven't had any on-site inspections for the last two years. We need to get our boots back on the ground. It's not only that we want to see what's going on in the Russian nuclear uh, bases, but that's also a kind of mutual confidence and uh, stability measure talking. You know, the inspectors talk directly to their Russian counterparts. It develops a kind of discourse that I think not only has uh, some effect in terms of building our confidence, but also can help to deliver a deterrence message to them from the ground up, so to say. So I think that's a, an early step that I would take. And if we were to get to a point, I think it'll have to be on the back of a stable ceasefire in Ukraine and the beginning of a, a peace process that looks to be producing results, then to begin again talking to the Russians about strategic nuclear arms control, but I would begin immediately by focusing on the framework to the follow-on for New START. I would not mess around with a big strategic stability dialogue. I'd go straight to the technical level, straight to the working level. Let's talk about what the framework will be, because the New START treaty goes out of force in February of 2027, and so we really need to be ready, ready for that. Uh, the last thing um, I would say is on the China-Russia front, nobody noticed it much, but when Putin and Xi got together on February 4th in the front of the Beijing Winter Olympics, remember that? It seems like 10 years ago or maybe 100 years ago. But they put out this long 6,000-word statement, 
And in it, the one thing they said about nuclear arms control was related to new constraints on intermediate range ground launched missiles, so-called INF missiles. And they said, we should be talking about moratoria on these missiles in both Asia and Europe. Great, that's the first time I've heard Xi Jinping say anything about nuclear weapons and constraining nuclear weapons. So what does it mean? I have no idea. But we should explore, we should ask, we should ask what they mean by a moratoria on INF in Asia. So those would be my areas of getting started again. I'd, I'd like to really echo um, Rose's point about the need, when the time is right, to act quickly. And I would hope that there's the political space to be able to do that. As unpalatable as it might seem to deal with uh, Putin after what he's done, we must make sure that we've got those uh, critical lines of communication open and being able to interact and engage with, the Ru with Russians in our own national security, as we have at lots of points during the Cold War. We've really made far too much progress from the height of the Cold War when we had between 60 to 70,000 nuclear weapons down to now where we have about 12,500 nuclear weapons. We can't let this be a moment where things spiral out of control. We undo all of the good work that people like Rose have worked so tirelessly for, because if we lose control now, it's gonna be so hard to get that back in the future and get us back on track. Yeah, and I just wanna make sure that, that we're being clear here, because right now the US administration is not talking to Russia about anything. And is it your assessment, Rose, and, and, and also Emma, that here there should be a carve out? Well, they're talking about prisoner swaps. That's a good thing. And I do understand that they are trying to fix uh, the mess in uh, the diplomatic space between the two countries. You know, we've really virtually shut down each other's embassies for some very good reasons, but I think there are some low-level talks going on. Again, if I were to go back uh, and start talking to the Russians, there are two things that need to happen. We have successful, more or less, track two conversations that continue. I think that's valuable. I would move those into a track one and a half space. In other words, having perhaps some officials coming, at least as observers, to listen and to perhaps have some quiet chats during the coffee breaks. So that's one thing I would do. But the other thing I would do, as I mentioned, is really get those talks completed to get the on-site inspections going, and when the moment is right, get the technical teams together to start putting in place a framework structure for an, uh, a follow-on to New START. Um, thank you for that. I, I want to turn a little bit to Iran here. Just be, it came up yesterday uh, in the session with, uh, with Richard Moore, the head of MI6, when he talked about whether or not Iran may be open uh, to accepting a a, a new part of the deal or coming back in uh, if the U.S. were to do the same. Rose, you were in the Obama administration when that deal was being negotiated. Uh, where do you think we are and what would you do now if you were in the administration with Iran? Well, they are continuing. When I hear from those who are negotiating and trying, uh, they're not negotiating directly with the Iranians, but trying to move this forward, I know there's a general feeling that um, it is still possible to retrieve the regime. The IAEA is ready to restore all the measures it has had in place to, to track what's going on in Iran. And we still have a, a, a little window, but it's closing, closing, closing rapidly. And I'm quite worried about what we've seen over the last week with Putin going to Tehran, our president, of course, last week in Saudi Arabia and, and visiting the Gulf states. So it's as if there's this, uh, geopolitical um, division opening up now that, that seems to make any chance of accommodation with Iran somewhat less possible. So to be honest with you, I am just on the brink of, I think, flipping from optimism to pessimism that we can resume uh, the JCPOA. If I were inside, I would say it's worth saving. I say it on the outside, it's worth saving. Let's see what we can do to make that happen. So you're worried about the deal or, or about negotiations, but how worried are you today about capability? Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, I share Rose's concern. I agree with Rose that the JCPOA is the best way forward to prevent Iran from getting nuclear weapons. 
We're concerned, though, that since the uh, Trump administration withdrew from the deal, Iran has been able to increase its uh, capability or capacity to enrich uranium. Uh, currently, um, has is probably, you know, not long, maybe less than a few weeks away from having enough material that it could use to fashion into a bomb if it chose to do so. And we heard from uh, Director Burns a few days ago that the assessment is still, they haven't got any evidence that Iran's decided to do that yet, but it is very concerning. And so really the way forward is not a military strike, but it's diplomacy to try to get back to the deal. And the benefits of the deal not only are removing uh, a certain amount or a large amount of material that Iran has acquired, putting limits on it, but also getting intelligence in on the ground um, through the IAEA's monitoring um, and inspections um, through increasing that. That is something we used to have under the JCPOA. We don't have it now. And um, this is really critical to be able to give us advance warning to go from months warning to the several weeks warning uh, if we got it now. And top US and Israeli national security figures have recognised this and have come out publicly and said that this deal is in all of our interests. Um, now, concerningly, I share Rose's pessimism or optimism slash pessimism going to the pessimism direction. When we heard the head of MI6, as you referenced yesterday, say he doesn't think that um, the Supreme Leader wants a deal, um, and Iran certainly isn't uh, accepting the deal that's currently on the table. And after, you know, lots of missteps and miscalculations on both sides, we're in a really tricky situation. And we heard President Biden and Minister Gantz talk about uh, military strike as a final resort. Um, let's hope we don't get there because we know from past experience that a military strike is unlikely to be successful. It might have the opposite effect of making the Iranians determined to get a nuclear weapon. And a military strike right now has the potential to escalate into a US-Israeli uh, war in the region, which would be devastating. Uh, particularly at this time when we're dealing with Ukraine, uh, with high gas prices and soaring inflation. This is something we don't need. So while we're pessimistic now, um, we have to really encourage and urge all uh, stakeholders in this to prevent escalation, refrain from escalating, and hope that we get to a point where we can fashion some time, kind of deal in the future. Just one final footnote on this. Uh, I think we've all forgotten in some ways but Russia and China were very much present at that JCPOA table and made a huge difference to the implementation of the deal in terms of investing their own resources, their own money to make things happen under the original deal. At this moment, I mean, up to the invasion of Ukraine, Mikhail Ulyanov, a very senior Russian diplomat, was tweeting very positively about where the deal was going and how it was soon to be concluded, et cetera, et cetera. So I see it also, if we can get back into some kind of successful rhythm of negotiations, also as a way to have a bit of a perhaps back door to reestablish some um, more substantive interactions with Russia and China on this set of proliferation issues. We're coming into the review conference for the NPT, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, August 1st, and it, it frankly looks like a bit of a train wreck to me, but we need to look for ways in every way we can to preserve that treaty. It's what has held nuclear proliferation at bay for a good 50 years. Thank you for that. And I actually wanted to turn to something um, that I know is important to you that uh, that Michelle Flor and I talked about yesterday, um, which is about the dangers of losing our military edge. Um, you kind of referred earlier uh, to the fact that Russia had completed its modernization. Uh, we have, uh, we are at the front end of that. Um, can you talk a little bit about sort of where those challenges lie for us? I wrote it down and I'm going to uh, take off where Michelle left off. She said yesterday, and I'm quoting, we are in danger of losing our military edge. We need to leverage our innovation ecosystem. The stakes are incredibly high. We could lose our deterrent capability. And she was talking about conventional deterrence in, an, in a Taiwan scenario. So I do feel very, very strongly. First of all, we need to keep our 
eye on the prize of nuclear modernization. We need to complete the modernization of our nuclear triad. We have the funding for that now. We have the program of record. We need to move forward and get the, the cooperation of the Congress to move forward and continue to fund that nuclear modernization and get it done. It's going to take into the 2030s. We cannot afford to lag on that. So that's the bottom line. But we also need to focus our attention on what we need to do to incorporate all the new emerging, some say disruptive technologies, our innovation ecosystem, leverage that in order to modernize our conventional forces and to be able, as I heard the general saying, he didn't have to look up in his first years in service, and now he has to look up because others are beginning to command not only airspace, but also uh, the cosmos, space itself. So everything we should be focused on now is ensuring that our conventional deterrent is right at the leading edge of innovation and technology. My view is if we pause now and start to throw money at nuclear weapons, and engage a nuclear arms race, then we will be losing sight of this top priority. And so, for that reason, I say, yes, let's get our modernization done of our nuclear arsenal. That is absolutely necessary. But keep it under the limits of a strategic arms reduction treaty so we have that predictability. We know we can't, uh, if we keep the Russians in bounds, they can't build up beyond the, the limits, for example, of New START, which is 700 delivery vehicles. We need to get the Chinese engaged if they are starting to rush to parity. We need to put them in that same space of being under bounds. But let us not lose sight of the deterrence threat that is coming at us on the conventional side and involves all of the new emerging and possibly disruptive technologies. I, I don't like to say disruptive because these are all to our advantage too. If we can command these technologies, we will be at the leading edge of the deterrence fight. Positive so disruption. That's positive disruption. But, but Rose, what makes you worried about the, the modernization? You sound like you think there might be pauses or delays that would, um, that would kind of harm our, our capabilities. There are two things that worry me a bit. I've seen fits and starts. Uh, it was President Obama who launched the modernization of the triad uh, with his program of record and initial decision making on the budget back in 2016, 2017. You know, it's eight years later, and we have seen fits and starts. We aren't off the ground the way I'd like to see with a number of our nuclear modernization programs. They involve not only the delivery vehicles, but also programs for the Department of Energy, National Nuclear Security Administration, our ability to, to uh, manufacture fissile material for pits, this type of thing. This work needs to go forward and needs to move faster than it is. So that's that worries me a bit, and that needs support of Congress, resources, et cetera. The second thing that worries me, uh, frankly, is uh, distracting from the program of record with programs that I don't think we, we need to pursue under the nuclear posture review. As I've understood, it's not out yet, finally, but there has been some, uh, some uh, view expressed that uh, under the nuclear posture review, we would put, be putting the brakes on a nuclear sea launch cruise missile program. I would say, great. That's absolutely fine. We don't really need that system. The Navy doesn't need that system. Uh, but there are people who are now supporting it and saying, let's, let's push that forward. But, but that's the kind of additional expenditure that I would much rather see going to the conventional deterrent side of things and building up our conventional capability. Great, thank you. Um, go, Emma, do you want to add something? Yeah, yeah, I think... Um, I'd, I'd agree with, with Rose on the need for a certain amount of modernization that keeps our forces uh, safe, secure, effective. Um, and I think questioning um, how much do we need and how much do we need to be spending, I think we've got predictions of upwards of a uh, trillion dollars over the next few decades, taking a really critical eye um, to you know, what spending do we need, where, what really keeps us safe, and not necessarily just having that knee-jerk reaction that, that sort of more spending on nuclear weapons is necessarily the answer. So I think um, looking at these critically, making sure that we're um, drawing on our resources um, in, a, in a 
good way um, that really helps uh, create that sort of kind of um, safe and secure environment we need, but without blindly uh, wandering off in the wrong direction. That's helpful, thank you. Um, we got a few extra minutes because people wanted to ask a lot of questions in this panel. So there's, um, there's folks with mics, if you wanna raise your hand, happy to call on you. Um, why don't we start with you, sir, and, um, and then you, that'd be great. And please just take a second to introduce yourself. Uh, good morning, my name is Steve Began. I'm with Macro Advisory Partners. Rose, my question is for you. A couple days ago, the Chinese ambassador was speaking, and if I'm not mistaken, I think him, I heard him say that the Chinese government is willing to take up the United States government's proposal for strategic stability dialogue. I may have missed that because I was still getting my head around the fact that he revealed that Hong Kong was on the cusp of being the 51st state of the union. But um, I think he heard, I, we heard them, him say that. Uh, if he did, or, or, or more importantly, if the Chinese government is willing to do this, how important is that uh, to start a strategic stability dialogue with China? And, and what, what should we try to accomplish with that? And, and Rose, can we just say how, um, how very humble Steve Began is that he didn't tell everybody that he was the Deputy Secretary of State. Yes, it jobs. And I've always <laughs> enjoyed working with Steve Began whenever I get the chance, including getting the New START Treaty across the finish line. Uh, that was a really helpful uh, kind of behind the scenes role. I don't know if you want to admit that, but thank you from this podium. <laughs> Um, Steve, uh, by the way, I want to quote Kay Bailey Hutchison, who yesterday said, wow, that was a, I, I'm, Kay, if you're in the audience, excuse me, I'm not quoting you exactly, but she said, wow, that was an imaginative presentation by the Chinese <laughs> ambassador. And I agree. <laughs> but I was glad to hear him speak uh, about strategic stability. And I, frankly, I think this is a good question also to ask Jake Sullivan, because it was he who, um, in his interaction with his counterpart a couple of months ago, evidently they agreed that it was timely to launch strategic stability talks. And when that kind of message comes from on high, not only in Washington, but also in Beijing, that means you're in business. That means you can get going. So I do hope that that means an opportunity will be forthcoming. Uh, I think, again, I would start slow and probably start small. I wouldn't start with summitry or I wouldn't start with a high-level interaction, but perhaps try to get teams together at a lower level, political, military level to, again, lay the groundwork, agree an agenda, set forth uh, where we really uh, could make some progress. And here again, I'm gonna come back to this intriguing offer of Xi Jinping in February, along with Vladimir Putin, to work on the INF problem and what we would do to perhaps put in place some constraints on intermediate range ground launched missiles to replace the now defunct INF treaty. So I would welcome knowing what Xi Jinping meant about that. So I think those are some areas where, where I would start. Hi, uh, Paul Kroger with the Bush School of Government and Public Service. Um, looking forward to the possibility of a strategic arms reduction treaty with China. Do you think that we would want to target parity with Russia and the United States, or would we try to constrain them a little bit below those levels? What, what is realistic in that arena? I know that's a huge debate in our own system, whether the Chinese are starting to rush to parity now. And frankly, I think, uh, I really do think the jury is still out on that. They have built about 300 ICBM uh, silos in those Western deserts, but you know, the Soviets for many years in the 50s and 60s played an ICBM shell game among multiple, multiple silos. And, and maybe that's where the Chinese are headed. I, I don't know. So I think we need to keep, again, a sharp eye on what they're doing but we don't need to panic. And in this period, I think we should do what we can to prevent them from rushing to parity. We should be willing to uh, talk to them about uh, restraint perhaps in our own systems in order to prevent them from rushing ahead. I don't know what that means as I say that, but I do think uh, really focusing in areas where they have some equality of capability makes sense. That's why INF makes such sense because they have a huge panoply 
panoply of intermediate range ground launched and other systems that are a direct threat to our carriers and our other forces in Indo-PACOM. So focus first where we have a threat and they have some uh, quality of capability. And then after that, we see where we go, but I would hope that we would have some years of strategic stability discourse so we understand better where they're going with their strategic nuclear doctrine. Are they changing now from what has been their stance? They've depended on second strike retaliation. Do they want to have parity with the United States and, oh, by the way, with Russia as well in order to be in a more uh, of a first strike deterrence relationship? I don't know yet. But again, I think strategic stability dialogue to illuminate that question and get to work on areas where they have some uh, equality of capability, INF, space-based systems, perhaps HGVs. Those would be three areas I think we could work with the Chinese on. And I wouldn't rush right to trying to get them to a strategic arms reduction table. I think I'd like to, you know, point out all the, the terrific suggestions and very specific thoughts that Rose has about things that need to be done to address the current situation that we're in, both with Russia and with China, uh, Iran and, and, and others. I'd sort of like to make a plea for us also to take a step back and think about the future. We heard uh, yesterday at the panel on, um, uh, I believe it was storytelling um, and fiction writing and forecasting, that it's very difficult to get people to imagine something um, quite so catastrophic as uh, nuclear war. Um, and I think what we need to do is look at new tools and techniques to think about how can we solve this critical problem that we're faced with now. And I, I mentioned it a little bit earlier when we are talking about nuclear deterrence. Clearly, nuclear deterrence has been at play with um, Ukraine in the Ukraine situation. But in relying on nuclear deterrence to guarantee our safety and security, we're also putting ourselves at risk because nuclear deterrence is vulnerable to mistake, miscalculation, irrational leaders and actors, which are all at play in the current crisis and will be at play in future crises. And it relies upon us having perfect information about intent of the adversary and um, our ability to act accordingly. And so we're really gambling a lot here and we need to be able to find a way to guarantee our security without threatening the annihilation of millions around the world. And we don't have all the answers. Um, but. There has to be a way and we have to find it. And I think the way we do that is by doing what so many people have called on at this conference, opening up spaces that are particularly small like uh, nuclear weapons policy, which has traditionally been uh, discussed by a small homogenous group, bring in new voices, new perspectives, new disciplines, younger people, many of whom are in the room today and are truly wonderful. If you get the chance to talk to them, please do. They've got blue lanyards on. Um, but we need to get out of this space of status quo thinking. We need to have a space where it's okay to challenge assumptions, ask questions, and engage in processes that we know are effective in problem solving for intractable problems. Because, and we need to start that now. We need to really invest in new ways of thinking, new ideas, new people, because this nuclear field has been starved for resources for too long. Since the end of the Cold War, everyone thought the threat was gone. And it's a small and struggling field. But I do see hope. I see areas and pockets of the community where people are applying systems thinking, thinking holistically about how nuclear weapons are affected and how they affect other areas. And I see some promise and hope. But we've got to start now. So we've got to focus on the immediate and really be critical about where we are and guarantee our safety, but think about can't we do better for our longer term and see that intellectual thinking right now. Only by doing that can we really be free of the threats from nuclear dictators. Okay. Just a foot stomp, I had coffee this morning with uh, our younger uh, colleagues and they're, well, they're actually entering into the middle of their careers and very impressive people. I foot stomp entirely what Emma had to say and I think we have a great opportunity uh, with this new generation coming up. Nice, great way to end with that nice shout out to the rising leaders here at the Security Forum. Uh, thank you both so much.